Garahanga, that's the right way to say it. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, hepatitis C care for mental health patients and particularly a pilot study. All right, before I do that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the traditional owners of the land. Oh, excuse me. The slides are moving here, but they're not moving over there. There we go. Um, yeah, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I live and work, and I pay my respects uh, to elders past, present, and emerging, and I would like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander colleagues sitting here with us today. All right, I'm going to be talking about um, the background of hepatitis C in, in mental health setting and more particularly a pilot study that happened where I work in the Hunts New England. So hepatitis, hep C is an infection of the liver that's uh, caused by hepatitis C uh, virus and it causes inflammation of the liver. Infection is acquired when the blood of a person, so I'm giving a little background because not, I have realized this is the first presentation on um, viral, blood-borne viruses, so I'll just give a small, yeah, little information. So infection is acquired when the blood of a person living with the virus enters the bloodstream of another. To date, we do not have a vaccine, and past infection does not provide immunity for future infection, so which means you can continue to be reinfected. So people uh, with mental health illness, like we've had all week, at a greater risk of hepatitis C virus as well, infection and hospitalization. It affects them 20 times, up to 20 times more than the general population. So hep C testing and treatment is not offered in our mental health settings, unfortunately. Um, so hepatitis C was first for mental health settings was first mentioned in the fifth national hepatitis C strategy, which just expired last year. And it was only mentioned, mental health settings were mentioned in other services that could provide um, support for priority populations. Fortunately, our current strategy uh, highlights the mental health setting as a key priority setting, and this gives us, you know, uh, we can leverage this to provide services for mental health settings and funding, really. All right, so what did we do? We set out to determine the effectiveness of a clinical practice change to initiate uh, improving routine testing of mental health patients for hepatitis C and then link them into care and provide um, treatment. We also wanted to establish the prevalence of hepatitis C among mental health patients in patients and the acceptability of this initiative in the two units that we were going to conduct this. So we did a pre-post pilot study that spanned 17 months for 2021 and 2022, and it included mental health staff, viral hepatitis uh, specialists, and the mental health patients themselves. Like I said, we did, the first unit was a 20 bed acute mental health inpatient unit within a rural referral um, hospital. And the other unit was a, is a 22 bed acute mental health inpatient unit located in a hospital in a metropolitan area. So the initiative was about uh, request, review, and refer. So we re requested doctors to offer hep C testing for all patients routinely and to order both tests. So if you haven't um, been familiar with testing, you need two tests for hepatitis, so there's a screening test and then the confirmatory test, which is the PCR. So, but most times we find that clinicians in mental health settings will just do the screening test and then you'll be required to come back or go to your GP for the confirmatory test. This initiative uh, required us um, to collect both samples for both tests at the same time. And there was a, an instruction that said, if positive, if antibody positive proceed to do the second test. So it kind of shortened the time, and then we, we didn't need to 
prick the patient again or call them back, have them visit their GP for that. And then review. Review involved review of results with the patient. So this included the NAS referral. It's a lab, a NAS-led model to review results with the patient and then facilitate additional testing, so such, such as the fibro scan, if it was necessary, or um, you know, liver, other liver function tests or renal function tests in case they needed to start treatment. And then determine appropriate um, care pathway for this particular patient. And all this was meant to be done in a period of under a week. So we were hoping that when your client comes in, so the average admission is uh, three to seven days for in mental health. So we're hoping that in five days, all this can be done and treatment started if necessary. And then refer, refer um, meant that would link via the NAS-led remote prescribing model. So we had, um, because of the complexities of prescribing anti um, hepatitis drugs, antiviral medication, DAAs, the mental health settings cannot afford to have this prescription done in hospital because it's about, used to be about 90,000 for a dose of medication. So the mental health said it, uh, hospital cannot afford to pay for this. However, if you do um, get an outpatient prescription, then you can have the close the gap scheme or PBS um, rebates and then it will come down to $38 or six point and some cents for close the gap. So we use the NAS-led remote prescribing model in the sense that we had um, the viral hepatitis specialist nurse practitioner from the John Hunter, so this is the referral hospital, um, prescribe remotely and then the client, the client's carer or the nurse, if they were able to, would go to a community pharmacy and get their medication. So the nurse practitioner faxed the prescription to the pharmacy and then some, a carer would pick that medication and then the patient would start while still in hospital. Or if they preferred, if they had a consistent GP that they wanted to keep using, they would then refer them to their GP. But we really encouraged um, using starting treatment where possible. And so determining the appropriate care pathway was really key for this initiative. Okay, so we used a um, series of implementation strategies, like you can see there. We had great support uh, from the steering committee group, and this is, made, is composed of all the leaders of you know, the different um, mental health settings, mostly, and population health. We had access to funding from New South Wales Health uh, for the nurse referral. And then we had, uh, to build coalition, we had a series of meetings. So this, we had weekly meetings, we had monthly meetings, we had fortnightly meetings with different groups just so that we have coalition and to ensure that you know, the initiative is understood and appreciated and maintained at all levels. We did um, do lots of training with the doctors particularly and the nurses that were in these wards. Then we had developed systems for the nurse referrer to monitor testing, the admissions and feedback to the clinicians and say, this week we were, we are at 35%, maybe last week we've improved by 7%. How we go in just to motivate, um, for the nurse referrer to monitor as well as motivate clinicians on how they're going. We had a lot of resources. We used posters, badges, prompt cards, and we also fed back with lab reports on the hepatitis testing that had happened to encourage you know, performance feedback. How did we collect data? We used medical records um, for both testing and treatment, for both participant characteristics, testing and treatment. And then we did a survey and focus group discussions for staff um, acceptability barriers and enablers. And we did a facilitated survey on mental health in patients. So this was assisted because if you remember, I said these were acute settings. So we needed to have one, our patient stabilized first and given the green light to go ahead and um, you know, conduct this kind, like obtain consent, all these things. So it, had, it was a facilitated survey. Um, 
after a green light from the staff, the ward um, staff. Our patients were ranged from 18 to 85 years, and the median age post-test was 39 and 40 pre-intervention. And then the most common diagnosis were schizophrenia, followed by substance use disorder, suicide ideation, trauma, and stress-related disorder diagnosis. Mind you, this was um, post-COVID about that time. But this is not, if you see the differences between the pre and the post period, they're not very different prior to the intervention. So in total, we had 633 patients. Uh, we had admitted and we had a bigger number at 492. And that's because, would like to think because that's when we, um, business started coming back to usual in 2022, but in 2021, I mean, we had lockdown and all of this, so we, we kind of attribute the 141 patients to that period, to that lockdown restrictions. Um, we had 221 tests ordered compared to 48 previously, and then we had 24 reactive antibody tests and had a 10%, uh, 10 of them detected for um, chronic hepatitis C, so that was a 5% prevalence in those units combined. Of, of the 10 patients, five initiated treatment on the wards that is using the nurse-led uh, nurse model, and three of three were referred, were referred on. So one went to their GP because they preferred their GP, another needed the specialist at the hunter, and one was an interstate client so preferred to go and start treatment where they had family. We're still following up the two. Hopefully we can find them because one, they were homeless and many other factors like you would be familiar with in a mental health setting. All right, so overall we had 11% increase in HCV testing. Uh, for unit A, unit A was a, is a rural hospital, is a 17% increase. And then unit B, a metro hospital, is had an 8% increase in testing. And 50% HCV treatment was pre prescribed overall. So because our indicator was a prescription written, so that's why it's 50%. But of the 10, which we're almost sure that the other three that were referred started treatment. But we can't ascertain that because we don't have you know, an indicator of the prescription, but we think we hope that they started treatment. Um, so unit B had a 75% increase in treatment, which we liked and which was good and similar and unit A had 33%. So um, what did the patients say about this initiative? So 12 patients, a total of 12 patients responded to the survey and 92% strongly agree that they would accept treatment whilst at the unit. 83% strongly agree that hepatitis C testing should be part of routine testing on admission. I mean, this is good to hear. And then 83 were confident and would complete the treatment of eight to 12 weeks because we asked the question if they would do an eight to 12 week treatment on top of their normal medication. And then 83% strongly agree to being comfortable talking to a nurse or any other staff on that ward about hepatitis C. And this is because we would like to attribute this to the training and the awareness of the people on those wards. 67% strongly agree that uh, they can be supported by friends and family to complete treatment and are confident they would know how to get treatment. Would like to increase this. 67 is above average, but it's not the best. What happens with the clinicians? The clinicians are all of them agreed that HCV testing was important and we should include it in routine testing. And 90% indicated that testing and treatment was implementable. And this is what the initiative was about really. We were meant to do this testing, not as an additional test, but as part of routine testing. So when a mental health client comes in, they have other tests going, full blood count, you know, urinalysis. Should, shouldn't we include hepatitis C? on those other tests because, I mean, they are high risk, all the risk factors point that they need this kind of screening. 
this was without barriers. So the clinicians thought that they have a high workload burden. And then they lacked the knowledge to complete the care tasks for hepatitis C. They, some of them had perceived low importance of testing for hepatitis C. And then they had low confidence with the prescribing. <clears throat> they also had competing um, medical priorities. Like you can imagine, it's a acute setting. I mean, you, you have other things to deal with in that moment until the patient is stable. And then also the associated requirements are challenging. So to order to prescribe um, hep C treatment, you need to either make a phone call or like there's so many steps and a lot of paperwork that you have to do so that you know you can get that prescription. Well, one is to make sure that we're using the money well, but also we need to probably reduce the red tape because the drug is expensive. Um, we did have facilitators, so clinicians uh, personal, personal value for hep C testing and believing it's important was a good, good facilitator. The reminders and prompts by the program champion, um, organizing care was good. Like if you had a nurse referral doing all the, you know, the paperwork was very, was helpful for the clinicians. Uh, the, the education and then having, performing the hep C along other routine um, blood tests so that there's no need for extra, you know, consent and all this and pricking and then clear instructions having exactly tell the clinicians right order HCV requested or you know, would say um, RNA test if hep C positive so it was clear they knew what to do and they knew the right test because there's a series of tests hepatitis tests um, in in pathology when you're requesting so in conclusion, routine uh, hep C care in mental health is feasible, and we think implementation support increase, we found that implementation support increased the testing and treatment in our units. And then data on the barriers and facilitators to HCV care will be used to refine our implementation strategies to better support mental health clinicians. And uh, these strategies, we need to test them further. So essentially if mental health, uh, New South Wales Mental Health and the Health Commission um, essentially saying, uh, please help us do robust research so that we can know whether or not these strategies are good for, you know, on a large scale so we can inform local, state and national policy as well as practice. So these are the <coughs> posters we used. And I would like to, uh, to acknowledge Hunt New England, Mental Health, uh, New South Wales Health, John Hunter Clinic, the Mental Health Lived Experience Advisory Group, and the Aboriginal Mental Health Service and Workforce Group. Um, there's a whole team behind me that did this work. Some of them are here in the room, Marie and Caitlin. There's people at home, probably they're watching, and I'd like to say thank you so much for the great work. Thank you, Judith. Really interesting presentation. Does anyone have any questions? And we, the rest of your team at the back table, are they? Yeah. Okay. Um, so, uh, does anyone have any questions for Judith and her team? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic presentation and work. I was just wondering around how this, when this started, because it, it's, I've seen mental health units do hepatitis C testing, trying to do it on their own, and I've seen yeah. like yours try and do it on their own and get into mental health. But how did that start with that connection? What was it like interfacing with the mental health service? Because that can be quite tricky from the two different frames of mind that you come from. Yeah, thanks for that question, Patrick. Yes, um, this, so we did <clears throat> have a long standing relationship with mental health. So it started off with the HIV um, AIDS time when we we're trying to introduce routine testing for HIV in mental health settings. So we've had a long standing um, relationship. So we leveraged that and moved on to hepatitis C when we needed to. Um, we did conduct a lot of meetings. We met with literally everybody in those units. Um, unfortunately, when we were ready to set off to start um, the project, unit, unit B, where we saw the 75% increase and 
just the 17 percent was a new unit altogether we had never interacted with it so the original unit was changed because it was made into a covid ward and so we had to move into another mental health acute setting so we're actually excited that we saw those results because we had no relationship with this unit we had spent almost two years trying to build a relationship with the previous unit only for it to be closed down for you know a ward. but the essential to answer your question is that you have to meet with everybody. We met with the, advise, the consumer group and they advised us on this model so we didn't just wake up and just think. You know, we had uh, meetings with the clinicians, the doctors, the nurses, the steering committee group. We had a lot of work happening two years prior, engaging two years prior to starting the project. Yeah. Thanks. Is it quick? One quick question. So this is just to add um, to Judith's input, because I was one of the nurse referrers that was originally trained. And I know initially when this project was before it actually started, there was a lot of in-services that Megan and Judith were involved in, in talking about hep C and how we actually felt about integrating it into our care. And, you know, I work in the mental health and substance use outpatient service, but I have worked in the inpatient unit, which we were originally considering starting with mm -hmm. um, and I know you know those conversations actually piqued my interest as it did a lot of clinicians within my service um, and I think that's kind of where it started so we already had this relationship that kind of just continued from there mm. yeah so building relationships really is the key thing yeah. thank you Judith uh, and I'm sure you'll be happy to talk to people afterwards if they've got further questions oh, thank um, you everyone thank you going to